Tonight on our century, sex, sun and the great outdoors. The hundred year battle between Australia's sun worshippers and the moral minority who tried to stop them. Well, Fred, I must say that I'm getting a bit sick of having sex thrust at me. The wowsers and the womanizers. I feel ridiculous. What am I supposed to do now? From beach inspectors to beach bums, how Australia shook off its prudish past. We like to call it God's own, and why not? With its golden sand and surf and sunshine, it's a real Garden of Eden. Yet it was right here in 1902, on this beach, that our public morals were first challenged. A local larrikin put on his old-fashioned cozies, and he went for a swim. But he did it in broad daylight. Now, how could anyone be that brazen? It's hard to believe, at the turn of the century, that was really shocking. And the Aussie lifestyle would never be the same. Nowadays, of course, on and off the beach, well, anything goes. Sometimes it seems our dress sense outstripped our common sense. Like this outback Queensland race meeting in the 1920s. Heat and dust and fur were all the go. Or a game of beach cricket. No need for shoes but always wear a tie, please. We started this century uncomfortably overdressed, still thinking we were in England. The maiden form was wrapped in metres of material. In this perfectly prim and proper period, a beauty pageant was judged by deportment and personality. The underwear had everything but a lock and key. This picture show promotion in 1926 tells the story. Every woman knows she plays a better game if her sporting rig is styled correctly. Not even Harry Houdini could play tennis in that rig. The lingerie and the laws were like a straitjacket. In Melbourne, they fined a barber seven shillings for shaving a customer on a Sunday. It was an old English law from the 17th century. The Sabbath was sacred. And Melbourne was the last city in the British Empire to open its art galleries, its libraries and its museums on a Sunday. That was in 1904. But there were some concessions made to the warm climate. Everyone wore hats. To the football. To the races. And even to end a world war. Armistice Day, 1918. Ladies were asked to take their hats off in the pictures, in fairness to the gentlemen. Australia needed to let its hair down, and champion swimmer Annette Kellerman was just the person to do it. Her tight-fitting costumes left some gasping for breath, even out of the water. Australia just wasn't a big enough pond for this water bay. In 1916, she starred in the Hollywood feature film Neptune's Daughter. Now remember, on our public beaches, it was still against the law to flash your navel. But Annette Kellerman exposed hers to the world and got away with it. But when Miss Kellerman went one strip further, she caused an absolute sensation. This was the first nude scene in a major movie. So, cover your eyes. I wrote a book called Fairy Tales of the South Seas. And now I've started a novel. Of course, I don't think that'll ever see the light of day. Because nowadays, a novel has to have so much sex appeal. And I don't know a thing about that. <laughs> In the 1920s, Australia's daring darling was earning $4,000 a week with her films and her water follies. She was every young Australian woman's 
homegrown risque role model. I'm going camping for four whole weeks. I'm not going to wear any clothes. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. <laughs> and I'm awfully glad to be back in Aussie again. It's a real thrill. Annette hung up her cozies and retired to surface paradise. She lived a full and a free life till the age of 88 when they scattered her ashes across the Great Barrier Reef. To go topless on the beach for the first time. It was many years before women could be quite so brazen. Married women in the district do not take kindly to the thought of their husbands looking at topless bathing here on Bondi Beach. You know, when you think about it, the beach has always been Australia's main battlefield in the fight over public decency. Believe it or not, in 1900, you could only swim at the beach at night, between 8pm and 6am. But in 1902, this larrikin, William Gosher, defied the council's laws by taking a plunge at Manly Beach. Other rebels quickly joined him. So, by public demand, the daytime bathing ban was lifted. And this was Manly eight years later. Australia's passionate love affair with the beach had begun. Now, the history books tell us that swimming costumes in those days had to go from the neck to the knee. But hang on, this girl is wearing a figure-hugging costume that doesn't leave much to the imagination. And notice, no one is giving her a second glance. So, we will. Most people didn't really care what men and women wore on the beach. But as always, do-gooders and local councillors thought that they knew best. They'd lost the battle to keep us out of the water, so instead, they ordered bathers to cover up. My baby to say that I'm all wrapped up in sunshine underneath the sky blue Cause I'm sailing on a sunbeam on my way to you Not a cloud is gonna stop me Sunbaking in those early days was regarded by authorities as loitering. On New Year's Day in 1913, seven men were arrested in Sandringham, Victoria for the serious crime of, get this, reclining on the beach in bathing costumes. How wicked was that? The bronze Aussie was still years away. After the mass slaughter of World War I, the arguments about public decency on our beaches somehow seemed trivial. And fashion designers started making clothes which were lovely to look at and comfortable to wear. At the same time, the starch was coming out of Australian society itself. But if the swimming costumes were shrinking, the beach inspectors loomed large. These days, our surf lifesavers wear as little as possible. But back in the 1930s, they were weighed down in heavy woolen cossies. Even so, they got away with less than most swimmers. This may well be the first wedgie ever recorded. But the real breakthrough in swimwear came down from the heavens at the end of World War II. What's this? Yes, it's a design for beachwear. Evidence of the changeover that's taking place. They're making swimsuits now. Here it is, the Turner swimsuit. The parachute yields pride of place to the Australian beach girl. No doubt about it, scanty day. <laughs> Happy days are here again. It seems that our greatest social changes usually happen after a war. In 1946, for example, the divorce rate doubled over the previous year. And women who'd worked flat out through the war years now wanted the freedom to kick up their heels. But the old myths lingered on. The whole field of fashion is just the setting for a gigantic conspiracy to manoeuvre man into marriage. The truth is that women dressed up to please themselves. Still undressing pleased both sexes. French Tivoli artist Micheline Bernardini is one girl whose bathing suit never got wet. She's down for a simple swim at Maroubra in a very simple suit. 
In the 1950s, the law said that swimming costumes had to be at least three inches wide at the bra and the hips. Well, I think it's, uh, it's all right on the top, but the bottom is very rude. Well, that's, that's just my personal opinion. And it seemed a woman's bare belly button was more than the inspector could bear. Each Inspector Melville is taking the matter in hand. You can't do that there, yeah. Conceived in France, the bikini caught on quicker than all its rivals. Hollywood's reply to the French swim outfit. All Americas gug gar about it. That's why they call it the hubba hubba. That, by the way, is the newest word in the American slang dictionary. Anything that's good is hubba hubba. Now in 1964, the girls are putting on a bolder front than ever. The topless swimsuit has made headlines throughout the world. What could possibly be more daring for women? The bikini was the symbol of the swinging 60s. The beach had become a national icon. In 1954, on her first visit, the Queen felt the sand between her tyres, if not her toes. And where else but in Australia would you find a Prime Minister getting his gear off for a surf? Along the coast, surf clubs report 200,000 people cooling off in the water at night. And boy, do those waves feel good. It seemed that there weren't enough hours in the day to enjoy the beach, so we extended them. Daylight saving was first trialled in 1917, but it didn't catch on. In 1942, our clocks were again wound forward to save energy in wartime. Quarter past seven now, Eastern Summertime, quarter past six in Queensland, quarter to seven in Adelaide, quarter to six in Darwin. And at birth, it's, 60, it's now 16 past four. Today in summer, we have more time zones than any other country in the world. But our obsession with the great outdoors has come at a price. The price of skin cancer. That thing on your lip is getting worse. No. No, don't touch it. Here's your mirror, Daddy. You told me you'd see a doctor last week. All right. I'll see him tomorrow. This Queensland health That's education right, film right? was called Danger Signal. It was made in 1946. Well, he said I had nothing to worry about. Oh, that's a relief. I thought it might have been a cancer growth. Yet for the next 30 years, we forgot to remind Australians that we lead the world in skin cancer. Slip, slop, slap. It sounds like a phrase when you say it like that. If you grew up in the 60s, getting sunburnt was a necessary start to every Australian summer. We didn't notice that there were some years when more people died from skin cancer than on our roads. Thankfully, public education brought the cancer toll down, but it hasn't stopped us from hitting the beach. If Australia was to grow up as a nation, then it needed to shake off some of the social and moral hang-ups of its British past. But it wasn't easy. If Queen Victoria shut her eyes and thought of England, then that was good enough for Dame Edna as well. Did you give your children sex instruction? Well, you see, uh, Norm thought I'd told Kenny, and I thought Norm had told him, so it worked out rather well for us. The sexual revolution hit Australia in the late 60s. It was everywhere. The nude scenes in hair had us buzzing. And in 1973, so did this smooth talker. I say that's a very nice see-through I'm getting. Oh, I didn't think anyone would notice. I've been wearing it for days and nobody said a thing. And that's a very nice pair of breasts you're wearing too. Oh, do you like it? It was meant to be fun rather than erotic. It seemed Australia had finally reached puberty. We were curious about sex, of course. We wanted to rebel against our parents and their attitudes. 
but we were still self-conscious when it came to talking about you know what. Well, Fred, I must say that I'm getting a bit sick of having sex thrust at me from paper, newspaper, where there just doesn't seem to be any need for it to be put. Mm. Well, you know, Marshall McLuhan has said that uh, the medium is the message and the medium is the massage. Wowsers were the moral guardians of our century. In 1912, West Australian Premier John Scadded described a wowser as a person who was more shocked at seeing two inches of petticoat than he would be at seeing a mountain of misery. When the tango came to Australia in 1914, the Wowsers predicted that it would corrupt our women. And Wowsers decried the evils of King Alcohol and made sure that our pubs were shut by six o'clock. It was the Wowsers who even tried to abolish the Melbourne Cup holiday in 1906. But this was a battle that they were never going to win. Despite the moral guardians, life went on. In 1900, the sex industry was booming, but never spoken about back then. Society insisted on a woman wearing white down the aisle. But men didn't marry until they were 30, and brothels flourished. A prostitute got two and six for a brief encounter. And this was the equivalent of what a typist or a female tailor would earn in a week. These narrow lanes off Palmer Street are periodically thronged with men seeking the prostitutes who use the small rooms behind these doors. At present, the area is under close police supervision. In the 1960s, sex was on sale and on show. Here, in places like Livio's Triporama, Girls, who are convinced that they're in show business, perform their mechanical routines for audiences who are convinced they're seeing something exciting. The next year we'll see a change in the, in the method of dressing. I think it's quite possible that the hemlines will go down and the necklines will go up. But one thing you can say about the moral minority, they never give up. Yes, and I could wear one because I only got two little buttons. The packaging changed from decade to decade, but throughout our century, the sales pitch was the same. Now you're moving closer, and as you get right in, I want you to bite him on the shoulder, right? This is award-winning film director Fred Skepsy in the days when he was selling toothpaste. When you're as close as a kiss, you'll be glad you used turbans. And even the most straight-laced of Australians recognise the persuasive powers of a pretty girl in a swimsuit. Mr Menzies, he's such a good-looking man. He speaks so nicely. Anyway, you get fined two pounds if you don't vote. As they say, if you can't beat them, join them. In 1971, the Prime Minister of Australia was Billy McMahon. President Richard Nixon hardly noticed Billy on this White House visit. But the whole world noticed the split in the dress that Sonia McMahon was wearing. Out of Australia's backyards, a new wave of designers and models burst onto the world. And Aussie blokes started to make a fashion statement themselves, kicking off the stubbies and the thongs. It's the latest thing in fashion for men. Pierced ears, just a five minute operation. Once, earrings for men were worn only by swashbuckling pirates and gypsies, but now it's for everyone, from office boys to executives. Australian society was also changing around us. Surveys showed that 70% of women had premarital affairs. Oddly enough, no one bothered to ask men the same question. In 1970, South Australia became the first state to legalise abortion. In 1975, the grounds for divorce were relaxed. Divorce rates have doubled since then. In 1976, nude bathing was finally legalised on two Sydney beaches. And as we approach the year 2000, the race is on for a nude Olympics. You know, it seems that Australia today is finally comfortable in its climate. We eat and drink outdoors. Our favourite cosmetic is sunscreen. A t-shirt and shorts is our national dress. 
in the process we'll become a bit more tolerant and a much more open-minded society. Now remember, it was right here in 1902 that William Gosher shocked our morals by swimming in broad daylight. But at least he had his cozies on. Up in the mountains in that same year, 1902, some other jokers dropped the lot. And these skinny dippers are, believe it or not, Australia's founding fathers. Federal senators taking a break in the Snowy River during their search for a location to build the nation's capital. It goes to show that underneath all the fancy dress, we're all pretty much the same. For all the memories and images of the past 100 years, be sure to get your copy of the Our Century Book, available wherever good books are sold.